from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody. I'm Josephine Reed. I produce and host the weekly podcast for the National Endowment for the Arts called Artworks, which you can check out at arts.gov, where you can also find our fabulous blog and short documentaries about arts throughout the country. So there's the shameless plug for the NEA. <laughs> I want you... Thank you. Welcome to a conversation about legacy and novels with Julia, Julia, Julia Glass and Jennifer Haig. This is going to be the shortest intro ever. So, Julia Glass, her most recent book is A House Among the Trees, the story of a relationship between a celebrated, recently deceased children's writer and his assistant, which is further complicated by his wishes for the disposal of his estate. Julia is the author of five previous books of fiction, including Three Junes, her debut novel, which won the National Book Award in 2002. Julia has received a number of fellowships, including one from the National Endowment for the Arts in Creative Writing. Jennifer Haig's most recent novel, Heat and Glass, has just come out in paperback. And like in it, she returns to the Pennsylvania town of Bakerton, where the issue of fracking is upending the community, and folks there are slowly discovering that what they were promised is not necessarily what they're going to get. Jennifer is the author of the short story collection, News from Heaven, and four novels, including Baker's Towers and Mrs. Gimble, which won the Penn Hemingway Award for Debut Fiction. And Jennifer is also a recipient of a fellowship in creative writing from the NEA. Okay, we know who we are, so let's begin. First of all, when I'm, when I'm thinking about legacy, and Julia, in your books, there's the personal legacy in the possessions of Mort Lear, your author, and then the literary legacy that he leaves behind is impact on generations of children. And Jennifer, with your book, it's the legacy basically of geography, what, what the earth leaves us, and how we use it, and then how previous macro decisions about energy factors into what, what we're looking at today. So I actually think it's a, it's a really fruitful conversation on both the micro and the macro level. Julia, I'd like to start with you simply at the beginning about what draws you to a particular ideal idea for a novel. So uh, my novels don't start with ideas, they start with characters, and there are many different ways that different authors approach the material they're working with, but um, for me this novel started because I happened to read an article in the New York Times that was published shortly after the children's book author Maurice Sendak died, and it focused on how the will he left behind was not at all the will that was expected. In fact, he completely um, scorned this museum in Philadelphia, which had reasonably believed that they were going to inherit all of his artwork, um, and he left them none. Now, uh, what, but the part of the article that interested me the most was that he, the executor of to, who was to carry out all these wishes was a, a woman who had lived in his house with him for many years, starting out as his dog walker, becoming probably his professional assistant, and then became I think in his older years, probably a domestic helpmeet. And uh, there was a lot of uh, criticism from the literary world that who was this woman? She couldn't possibly be qualified to undertake, you know, sh to shoulder the legacy of this great man. And I just thought about her, and I thought, what would it be like, first of all, to live your life in service to a genius, to a great artist? What's it like to be in that orbit or in that centrifugal force? And then what would it be like to be left, not just with the material legacy, but with the reputation, especially if secrets emerge, as they often do after someone dies? What do you do with the things you find out? Um, does the world deserve to know them? Um, and as you know, the plot is, is also complicated by the fact that the, the artist in my book who's inspired by, but not based on Maurice Sendak, whose name is Mort Lear, uh, there was a movie in development, a biopic about his life, and the actor cast to play him had been in correspondence with him and is 
was expecting to meet him, and the novel begins the day that that actor arrives, when instead he has died quite suddenly, 10 days before. So yes, the recall. assistant and the actor meet. And I, I'm glad you, you brought that up, because one thing I really did want to ask you, you had Tommy the assistant and Meredith the uh, jilted museum curator. And I think most authors at that point would say, that's pretty, you know, plenty of conflict, let's just call it a day and, and focus on them. But you brought in that third leg. You brought in right. Nick Green, who added just so a lot of richness and, and complications to the book. What made you go in that direction and, and bring that character in? <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a long story, but I, I should say that I have a 21-year-old son who is passionately involved in acting. Um, all he wants to be is an actor, which they say is the only way to approach being an actor. It better be the only thing you want. Um, and you can imagine I'm a little frightened about that, but as all my friends say, I'm not in the position to discourage a child from following their creative <laughs> urges, so good luck to me. Um, but um, it, it really grew, Nick Green's character grew out of conversations and arguments with my son about actors and their portrayals and what goes into being an actor and how you portray a real person, whether that person is living or dead. And as any of you who go to the movies know, a lot of films these days are biopics, whether they're about Alan Turing or Stephen Hawking or, or um, the painter Turner or um, Steve, Steve Jobs. I mean, that's, that is a very big part of our film storytelling now. And, and in a way, the actor also holds the legacy of that person in their hands when they approach that performance. Jennifer, in the case of Heat and Light, this is the third time that you've returned to Bakerton. Can you tell me how, that, how your geographic roots really inform your work? My three Bakerton books are very much books about a place. They're stories that could not have happened anywhere but in this little coal town in western Pennsylvania. I call the town Bakerton. Um, it's very much modeled after the town where I grew up in Cambria County, Pennsylvania, called Barnesboro. Um, and this, this location, this, this town of Bakerton, has really become a character of mine, and it's one that I return to again and again. Um, the first Bakerton book was called Baker Towers, and it was my second novel. It was set um, in the 1940s and 50s when uh, the coal mines were booming and the town was vibrant. That, to me, was a story I'd always wanted to tell because you know, by the time I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was all over for coal mining in my part of Pennsylvania. And all these stories I had heard about the glorious past of this town were just stories. So I think that novel grew out of my desire to time travel back to those years and see what it was really like. Um, you know, there's a, a character in Heat and Light who uh, is thinking about his town, and he says, the town is all aftermath. And that is very much my experience of growing up in that town that had already seen better days. And um, so I wrote a book about those better days, um, Baker Towers, published in 2005. And for a long time, I thought, OK, I did it. I said everything I had to say about this town. I time traveled back to the glory days. OK, done. I can go write about something else. And I did. I wrote two more novels set in Boston, where I live now. And uh, I thought I was done with Bakerton. Um, but you know, in those years, a funny thing happened. Um, I found myself thinking about some of the characters in Baker Towers. and wondering how their lives turned out. I mean, that for me is what novels are about, how people's lives turn out. And so um, I gave myself permission to write a short story, one short story, about Joyce Novak, who is the main character in Baker Towers. And that story led me to write another story about her brother Sandy, who's sort of a mysterious figure in Baker Towers. Um, and I wanted to write a story that would let readers know what he was really up to, what, was, what were his secrets. And so each of these Bakerton stories led me to write another Bakerton story. And pretty soon I had a collection of 10 of them, all set in or around this town. Um, those stories I call News from Heaven um, really deal with what the aftermath was. What was it like 
to live in that town after the mines died, after the town's reason for being had dried up and blown away. Then what happens? How do people find a way to continue? And so that was very much the question at the center of those stories, News from Heaven. So after that, I thought, okay, now I'm really done. Because clearly, nothing else is ever going to happen in this town. I'm done. There is no more. Um, and right around that time, this fracking story started to be all over the news. Um, and I'm sure many of you um, have been following this. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of conversation about natural gas drilling in Pennsylvania, New York State, West Virginia, Eastern Ohio, this uh, formation called the Marcellus Shale. Geologists had known for 100 years that it was down there, but until recently, we did not have the technology to extract that gas. There was just no way to get to it. That changed in the 90s when Halliburton developed this technique of hydraulic fracturing. They at first used it on oil wells, but then they found this was also a way you could extract natural gas. And so for these regions of Pennsylvania, where it seemed to be all over, there was suddenly this new possibility that a lot of people were very excited about. That you know, for people who had been mourning the death of the coal industry for a generation, it seemed like, oh, for the first time in 30 years, we have good news. There's opportunity for people here. There are going to be jobs. There's going to be prosperity again. Um, so it was really greeted with, uh, with a great deal of hope by, by people in Western Pennsylvania. Um, of course, as you all know, it's not quite that simple. There's also um, a case against fracking um, that, you know, that, that is real. Um, there are legitimate environmental questions about the safety of fracking. Um, so there has been a real uh, heated argument going on about the, the advisability of fracking in the Marcellus Shale. So heat and light is a story about what happens to a town when they say yes to fracking when the gas industry moves in, when people are leasing the mineral rights to their land, um, and, and how life changes for everybody involved. So this is a surprise third act to my Bakerton story that I wasn't expecting ever to write, but it, it was just a book that, that life gave me. And, and that happens sometimes when you're writing novels. There are books that life just gives you. If you're paying attention to the world around you, Sometimes a novel just about drops down on your head, and that's what Heat and Light was. I find with both, with both of your books, it's, they seem to be asking many questions, but among them it's, what, what do we value? What, what, do our, what do possessions mean? What, what dreams do we have? What dreams do we let go of? What do we do in the pursuit of those dreams? Well. You know, that's an interesting way to look at it. But I actually want to talk about something a little bit different. And I want to, because right I also want to ask Jennifer about it. And it has to do with the choices that we make in life. Um, I found myself having a conversation with my older son the other night um, where I said to him, we were talking about, we'd seen a movie, and the characters obviously had regrets. And I said, you know, honey, as you grow older, you will find that you will have regrets. I said, if anybody tells you that they have no regrets, they're either very shallow or they're lying to you. Um, because, um, and then I was thinking about choice. And I always talk about the choices my characters make and how they guide the plot. I, I write ahead into the dark. Um, and so one of the things in my book is, is not just what do the characters value, but why have they made the choices they've made that have led them to this moment? And which choices do they look back on as choices that maybe they shouldn't have made? And one of the things that I really loved about Heat and Light, and by the way, you know, as someone who writes from character, and I teach, and I teach my students that characters are, they're the meat of the story. I just was blown away by how many fully realized characters are in Heat and Light. And as I wrote to Jennifer after I finished it, I, I love the first character, even though he's a very morally complicated man because he's trying to get the people to sign these leases for the fracking. Um, and then I saw that I was going to another character in the next chapter, and I'm like, wait a sec. I really wanted to be back with that character. And then I was in love with the second character. So, but one of the, the really important things, it seems to me, in 
heat and light is the whole issue of, of the choices that we make and what happens when the choices that one person makes conflict with the choices that a neighbor makes or a, or a spouse makes or and there's you know a lot of turmoil emerges from the choices that are suddenly forced on this community you know by this company that comes in the stranger that comes to town yeah, exactly right. Um, I mean, did you plot everything out? I mean, I need to ask. Yeah, yeah I heard well, that. Actually, that was so in I my was mind. Just <laughs> at, so I was just at, at, at uh, Tobin Anderson's thing, and I've actually never heard this before, but somebody asked him, are you a pantser or a plotter? Do you know that term, pantser? Well, he said, oh, yes, well, for those of you who don't know, that's a writing term that means, do you plot your book out or do you write from the seat of your pants? And I, I, I'm a, so I just found out I'm a pantser. So are you a pantser or are you a plotter? The answer to that question is yes. Both. <laughs> I'm both of those things. Because here's what happens. Um, when I'm writing a novel, I never think about plot. I don't even use that word. What I, what I think about is causality. That every time an event happens in the story, it has to have a consequence that leads to another consequence that leads to another consequence. So really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm writing kind of a flow chart of the, of the consequences of choices people make. So to me, you know, plot is something that writers inflict on their characters, and causality is something that happens on its own in this organic way, that every event has ripples, and those ripples lead to other ripples. And so um, I may invent the first event, but then what I'm doing is thinking of all the, the penumbra of possible consequences of that event and choosing one. And then I do the same thing over and over again, and that's how the story gets built. It's, so I, I'm kind of, I'm a pantser in the sense that I'm just going as far as the next choice. And then I just play right. out the consequences of that. So it's, yeah. it's I don't know, it's a, it's a middle path. Right, but this, the plot in Heat and Light, or the story, I should say, it just um, has many moving parts, mm -hmm. partly because it has so many characters making so many different choices. And, I, and the writer in me, um, as opposed to the reader in me, um, was just wondering, you know, did you know where you were going to end? Did you know, because it is, because it's a story with a real moral backbone, but not heavy handed. So did you, did you know where it was going to come out? I did end? and I was wrong. <laughs> um, that's usually what happens to me. I usually think I have an idea of where I want it to go, but I'm always wrong. Um, so it's, um, it's, this was a book that was, a very hard thing for me to hold in my hands. It was like trying to hold water in your hands. When I started writing it, I thought I was writing just about this fracking controversy. Um, but as I wrote, I realized that the story was much, much larger than this. That in this part of the world in Pennsylvania, and this is a line from the book, that Pennsylvania is what lies beneath. It is a place whose destiny has been determined by its geology. You know, the first oil well in the world was drilled in western Pennsylvania. Most wow. people don't know this. Then we had 150 years of coal mining. We had deep mines. We had strip mines. We had the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster. So throughout its history, Pennsylvania has really been living the story of energy. And that's what heat and light is. And it's, it's a story that, you know, I do go to Three Mile Island. I do go back to the days of drilling oil in the 1850s in Pennsylvania. Because there's simply no way to understand this story except by looking at its context. This fracking thing didn't happen in a vacuum. Pennsylvania has been down this road before and before and before. And when you think about where we get our energy in this country, it's always coming from the same regions. It's always the same communities that are kind of left holding the bag. That it's West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio and Eastern Kentucky where coal mining happens. And those places profit from having energy extracted, and they also, at times, pay a terrible price. And so that's what I was interested in exploring in this book, both the benefits of having these rich natural resources and the hidden costs. So fracking is just a piece of it, really. Well, in, in the book, you taught Rich, one of your main characters, mentions that they're the kind of people who take showers before they go to work and the kind of people who take showers when they come home from work. And one thing I like about your work is you focus so often on the people who take showers after work, and that is very rare. Oh, it's very rare, and, and it's, um, 
it's something that I care a lot about. Um, all of my work in one way or another is about class. It is the subject I keep coming back to again and again and again. Um, I am struck by how little of our contemporary fiction actually deals with working class people. Almost none of it. Um, and there are reasons for that. Um, a lot of it has to do with the sort of feudal system of publishing, that publishing is such a very difficult field to make a living in that young people going into it kind of can't do it without a trust fund. You know, you get an entry level job in publishing that pays you $22,000 a year and you're living in Manhattan where your rent is, you know, $3,000 a month. How, how do those numbers work? Well, what happens is kids from working class backgrounds like myself do not go into publishing and become editors. And so what you have in American publishing is this sampling of editors who are by and large from comfortable backgrounds and tend to be drawn to stories that evoke the world that is familiar to them. You know, it's, it's subjective. What an editor decides to publish has a lot to do with um, what seems relevant to her, what, what reflects the world back to her as she knows it. So often, young editors are going to gravitate toward books about people like themselves. It's a natural human tendency. If we had editors from working class backgrounds, we'd have more books about working class people, but that simply hasn't been the case, at least for the last generation. So it is, it is my subject, and it is something that will probably always be my subject by virtue of where I grew up and the people I knew growing up. But they're working class people, you can find them in crime fiction. Yes. They yes. do. No, no really, really, they exist. Really. <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah. I, that's where it happens. Character, both of you have, are wonderful <coughs> at creating characters, as, as you mentioned, Julia, talking about Jennifer's work, where you, you, the reader just knows them immediately, knows them intimately, very, very quickly. How do you, how, what is the imaginative mining or leap you do to get inside a character and literally bring them to life? I get to start, I guess. <laughs> I'm looking at you, um, yes. yes you're, you're looking at me. Um, then I'm going to look at you. Well, I, I do go very, very deep. In fact, I think about it as a kind of mining, but it, I take my shower before I do the mining, so um, <laughs> sometimes after, too. But um, it's, I, I've, I've even had critics write that I'm, I frequently, not only do I write a lot of flashbacks, but I write flashbacks within flashbacks, and I have characters examine not only what they think of themselves, but what they think of what they think of themselves. And I've seen quotations from my books to prove it, otherwise I wouldn't believe it. Um, I, I do, I, 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 I'm only half joking when I say that the rhythm of my novels and the way that I write is what I call the um, psychotherapeutic rhythm. And, that is that I write along in the present tense in a character's mind for a while, and then I plummet into the past. But I don't know when that's going to happen. And then I come back to the present, and then I go back to the past. So it's like being in the therapist's office, and you're there complaining about your day, and how your boss was such a brute to you. You didn't get to take a full lunch, and you're complaining and complaining. And then there's a pause, and then the therapist says, well, does..." does that boss remind you of anybody else in your life? And you say, yes, as a matter of fact, my mother when I was 16 years old. <laughs> and then you start talking about your mother when you were 16 years old, and then you return to the present. And maybe you throw in a dream, but I'm always sort of going. Um, but it, I call myself the flashback queen, and it is in my characters' histories that the essence of who they are um, emerges. So I could not possibly create the characters I do without delving very deeply into um, what, where they come from, who they come from, um, the personal legacy. I mean, we talked about legacy in a larger sense, but each of us is a legacy. You know, it, um, the writer uh, Carol, who wrote Stone Diaries, Carol Shields. Shields. Carol Shields wrote in one of her novels, a line that, I, that really moved me, and personally I find it very true. She said, every novel is the story of the destiny of a child. Um, and, and in my work, that rings true. For you, it, it may be many children, but each character's story is inevitably going to touch on their earliest life. Um, 
and, and how they grew from there. This is something I really marvel at in Julie's work, that um, it, there's a real psychological acuity here. The truth is that we're all living in the past, present, and future at the same time, at every given moment. I mean, there has never been a five-minute block of your life where you didn't think about something that happened in the past or what you're going to have for dinner. You know, so we're, we do this very naturally all the time, this kind of time traveling in our thoughts. And Julie is really um, very astute at getting that on the page, that, that, that kind of human capacity to inhabit several, several different time frames at once. And um, I, I really appreciate that in her characters. And, well, in Heat and Light, it was a kaleidoscope of characters. It, That's a great expression. That was a lot to hold on to I as a writer. I am never going to do that again, by the way. <laughs> this book almost killed me. It, there are so many, um, so many characters whose, whose head you get inside. Um, that was not initially my plan for this book. What happened was um, I set out to write this fracking book when I didn't really know very much about the subject. I knew a little bit and I thought I had an opinion. And what happened was the more I learned about this question, um, the more I realized how much more I still needed to learn. This is not a screed against fracking. It's important to make that point. Um, I would not write such a book, and I certainly wouldn't want to read such a book. It's not that. What I'm doing in this book is trying to show accurately, well, this is how it is. Regardless of your opinion on this question, this is how it is. To have a, a drill rig 200 yards from your back door, what's that like? It's like this. You know, what is it like to be a man who's separated from his wife and family for six months and living in basically a labor camp and working 12-hour shifts on a drill rig? Well, this is what that's like. I'll show you what that's like. So it's really, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just sort of a camera, and I'm kind of showing all, all the facets of this question. And the reader is going to draw her own conclusions, of course. Um, that's not my role as the novelist to um, tell people what they should believe about fracking. It's, I just want to show as accurately as I can how it is. And this is how I ended up with this massive cast of characters, because every time I learned something new about this question, I found myself inventing a character who inhabits that part of the argument. So I talked to a lot of guys who work on drill rigs, and I have a character who works on a drill rig. You know, I have a character who's the CEO of a gas company. I have a farmer who decides to lease his mineral rights to a gas company, and another farmer who decides not to lease hers. I have a, an environmental activist and a geologist, and you know, all these people whose lives are affected by this question. It's not just the landowner, it's people who work in the gas industry. It's people who live in this town and don't even say, own any yeah. land, but are affected by what it does to their surroundings. So that's how I ended up with this very, you know, very populous novel with a very complicated structure. But that's also how you can write a book that, that is political, but not a screed, mm. but is an, a, just a really remarkable story where these characters are alive and breathing. Well, thank you. You know, it's a discovery I made in the writing of this book is that there are no villains in this story. Mm -hmm. I talked to people with a range of opinions about fracking, and the conclusion I came to is that every one of these people has good reasons for believing as he believes and doing as he does. These, there, there is no villain in this story. These are, these are people who act for understandable reasons. And I think, particularly when you're writing an issue book like this, it's, it's very important to make readers see the humanity of people who believe differently from the way they do. Um, and, you know, I, I did not meet any villains when I was doing the five years of research for this book, and I didn't write any villains in, in the novel. I, I want to touch briefly on research, because Julia, you, you both do research. I mean, for that book, my lord, I can't <laughs> even begin to imagine what that was like. And you wrote an essay about research. Oh, the one I wrote online for Random House? Yes. Oh, you're a good detective. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but nobody else knows that. <laughs> uh, so what, what are your thoughts about research? When, when, when do you let the research enter into the world of the book that you're creating? Well, for me, it depends on, um, on the book that I'm writing. Um, you know, if, 
if I were writing a book like Heat and Light, I think I'd have to undertake some research early on or midway through. But my general principle is that I do research as late as I possibly can. Um, and there are sort of two main reasons for that. One is that I'm lazy and I'd rather just live in my imagination and, and imagine what it would be like, you know. Um, for instance, uh, I had a character who was a pastry chef in, in one of my books. Um, and all sorts of friends said, oh, I know a pastry chef. You can go spend a day with a pastry chef. And because I really love dessert, you know, I thought that would be great, but I didn't, didn't really want to do it right away. In fact, I joked to my friends that the reason I was writing that novel is so that I could order dessert and call it research. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I just, I faked my way through it. I, I imagined what I thought everything was like, the construction of a wedding cake. And then I did my research at the very end, after I had drafted all these important scenes involving the craft of pastry. And uh, I was wrong about some things. But here's the thing, and this is the second reason I like to do my research late. You know, I was that kid who loved being in the library doing my, and I wrote the class paper was five times as long as everybody else's, whether it was on volcanoes or, you know, I was actually obsessed with volcanoes. I did it, one on volcanoes and one on Pompeii and Herculaneum. So um, I, I just love finding stuff out. And the problem is when you find really cool stuff out, you want to share it and you want to wedge it in there. You know, you want it to be in the novel, but maybe it doesn't belong there. So if you've already got the framework, it's harder to squeeze in all these really cool stories about the origin of wedding cakes in Hungar hung Hungary and, and Czechoslovakia and the cool stuff I found out by reading about the history of wedding cakes and, the, and also their architectural integrity. Um, and I'm sure that if I were researching, I'm sure you found out a lot of stuff that is not didn't have a place in the book, or, but maybe not. I mean, yeah. so how, how did yeah. you approach it for this book? Well, this book, um, I had to do some research on the front end just to know what I was talking about. Um, my favorite way of doing research is interviews, and um, yes. I, I, I interview obsessively. I talk to lots and lots of people, and this has been true for every novel I've written. And it's it's a it is, yes, it is research, but um, it's more than that. I'm not looking for particular information so much as I want to hear the voices of people living these different kinds of lives. And I find that do, doing a lot of interviews on the front end suggests possibilities for characters, it suggests possibilities for story, not just you know, factual things I need to know, but it's, I can't, once I start to do research, I see possibilities in the story I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So for me, it is integral to the writing of it. It's part of how I find the story. And it's you know, more true for some novels than for others. Heat and Light was a, was a massive um, research undertaking, more so than I realized when I started out writing it. Um, but you know, it was in the process of doing research that I found a lot of the story. And I often don't know what I'm looking for when I set out looking. You know, I just I just want somebody to say something interesting. I and if if I hear something that fascinates me, I'll follow it. I give myself permission always to follow the thread that fascinates, um, because I have to believe that if I find something fascinating enough, that there's something in there that a reader will be fascinated by too. So um, it's really, you know, I'm I'm casting a very wide net at the beginning when I do research. I don't quite know what I'm looking for. I'm hoping to find my book out there somewhere. Mm. Do you work closely with your editor? Um, not on the front end, no I don't. I have a terrific editor and I, I value him and he's immensely helpful with later drafts. Nobody, nobody ever sees my first draft of anything. Nobody should ever have to. <laughs> my first drafts are hideous and, and really I, I just want to burn them always. So I don't, I don't share them with anyone. I have a couple of readers who will see maybe a second or maybe a third draft, but never the first draft. So, and my editor really sees you know, a fourth or a fifth draft maybe. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is I don't want to know what anybody else thinks until I know what I think. Mm -hmm. you know, it really muddies the water if you get opinions from people before you've solidified your right. own. So I'm very, very cautious about asking for feedback and also cautious about using up my good readers. Because guess what? You only get somebody's first impression once. If someone's a good friend, you know, he might be willing to read it a second or third time, but he's never going to be able to read it with those fresh eyes. So I don't want to use up that precious first reading from one of my good readers until I'm sure 
I've gotten it as far as I can get it on my own. Julia, do you work closely with your editor? <clears throat> well, I, I ditto what she yeah. said. Okay. Um, uh, like and I, I love <laughs> my editor, and um, my weakness is that every book that I turn in to my editor when that dra draft is really done um, has pretensions of war and peace. I, I turn in these massive things, and um, now, now they're on electronically, but I've been writing long enough to have actually had to mail in a manuscript in two UPS boxes that weighed more than my healthy full-term first child, so <laughs> really is too much. And my editor is the nicest person in the world, so she'll receive this, and now she receives it electronically, and it still blows my mind that I push send and whoosh, you know, 800 pages goes over the ether, whatever, the cloud, the goes through the cloud. And, um, and she always is very complimentary at first, and she'll say, you know, if you want to publish an 800-page novel, then that's what we'll publish, which, and I'm sure she's lying through her teeth, because she knows I'm, I'm gonna say, no, obviously not. Um, so, and then we talk, and what's so interesting is the first conversation that we have after she finishes the draft, it's like we're gossiping about friends of ours, you know, like, well, I'm not sure I really am convinced that she fell in love with him. I mean, they're getting divorced, but when were they really in love? And she will hone in on the things that are missing, and also she'll say, you know, we don't need to know every single anecdote that, about so-and-so's childhood, like when he lost his first tooth and the first time he went <laughs> tobogganing and, you know, that first mm -hmm. argument he had with his mother when he was 16. So, um, but she doesn't actually really lay a pen on the manuscript. Um, she, we have a two-hour conversation and I go away and I know what needs to go and I know what needs to be sharpened, too. And so she's kind of, I, I like to say she's more of a midwife than a surgeon. And, uh, you know, so if, if my papers were ever going to be of any value to, value to anybody, they would be kind of boring because, you know, she maybe cuts a comma here and there when it actually comes to a written manuscript. Um, is, is that more or less true for your editor, too? Or is there a lot of close line editing? Um, well, last? you know, it's because I'm sending in a draft that I've been working on for yes. years that it's that there isn't so much on the, on, the, on the line level. There would be, if, if I made him read a first draft, oh, there would be blood on the page, but I would never do that to right. him. Um, so it's really, by the time he gets it, I've worked through a lot of that on my own already. Yeah. The, the other thing is I, I used to, um, it, early on, I would show, or even read out loud, but this was really bad, sections to my husband that I was very excited about. Well, first of all, if I read them out loud, it would usually be after dinner, and I'd be reading, and then I'd hear this noise, and I thought, that's, that's not snoring, is it? You know, and that's really not good for anybody. Um, but then the other thing is, if I gave it to him to read, um, he would come away and say, oh, this character Carl, is that our friend Tom? I go, that is not our friend Tom. And then I'd go back to working on the book, and all I could think about is Tom. So, so he doesn't get to see it any sooner than anybody else does either, and some of my friends think that's strange, but no, he does not get to see it till my editor and my agent and my husband all see it at the same time. <laughs> Jennifer, you once said that each book is an engineering feat, mm -hmm. that it has to work, and I was really intrigued by that, and I'd like you to say more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by machines. I, I love writing about machines, and I think of a novel as an extremely complicated machine. Um, the best comparison I can think of, um, some of you are old enough to remember this old board game called Mousetrap. Oh, I love Mousetrap. Who remembers Mousetrap? Oh, like everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, so Mousetrap, for those who don't know it, the object of the game is to build this complicated, ridiculous Rube Goldberg type mousetrap out of these disparate plastic parts. So there is like a rain gutter, and there is a, a staircase, and there's a crank you turn, and there's a bathtub, and, and these unlikely parts that you string them together, and finally it's a trap that will catch a mouse in the most convoluted possible way. That, to me, is the perfect metaphor for writing a novel, that you are, you are, building, you are building a story out of found objects in a certain way. Um, and it's, you want, it's a mechanism that you want to be able to flip a switch and have it work. Um, so when the first draft, what I'm doing is building this mousetrap out of these disparate parts. Then what I'm doing afterward is just testing and retesting and retesting the trap until it actually catches the mouse. So I write a first draft, 
and I kind of reverse engineer the thing and I look at where are the pinch points, you know, where, where does the ball roll off track, where do the gears get gummed, and I go in and fix those in a very mechanistic way. And then I run the trap again and I find the ball gets stuck in a different place. And I go and, and you know, diagnose those problems. So it's a very, my process of revision is quite mechanical and I really enjoy that. You know, I think of a novel as being like a car. I love cars. Uh, I find cars beautiful. But you know, when you turn the key in the ignition, all you care is that the engine turns over. So with a novel, yeah, you, you, want, you, want, to build, you, know, you want to build a beautiful machine, but it, the thing in the end just needs to work. So, so that's kind of what my revision process looks like. Does that make sense to you? I, I'm listening really hard. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible with cars, so maybe I'm paying more attention to, to cars, and then I'll... Now, that's a, that's a fascinating mm -hmm. metaphor. And you know, with my students, you talk about the engine turning over. Um, and I, Obviously, I teach fiction writing. And, uh, and the first thing that I have my students do for the first class is they have to bring in the first page only of a favorite short story or novel that they love in its entirety, but they really love the beginning too. And we dissect that beginning because I say, if you don't start you know, in the right place, if you don't pull the reader in, and I don't mean you have to hook them with a dead body or anything like that. I mean, it may be language that hooks them. It may be a, a lingering question that's already there on that first page. Um, th then you, you're already, already the journey is off to a bad start. So I focus a lot on that. You know, is it beginning in the right place? Is it beginning in the right tone? And we dissect beginnings. So I think that's kind of like the engine turning over. And then, you know, after that, it's a lot more work, of course. Um, I love uh, what Sue Miller said about writing a novel, which is a little different. She said that writing a novel is like knitting an argyle sock the size of a football field. <laughs> that's a little different. Maybe that's more monotonous. And a word about it's endings. Hard. Endings are hard. I, endings are very, very hard to accomplish. How, how many go-rounds do you typically have to do before you land on what you think is the place you want to end? I find endings so difficult that it makes me hate the whole first draft of the book because I'm living in fear that I'm going to get the ending wrong. You know, we've all had this experience as readers where you oh, fall in oh, love yes. with the book, you, you fall in love with the characters, yeah. and the ending is so horribly disappointing that you want to throw the thing across the room. Mm. Now, you will forever remember that as the novel with the terrible ending. You won't remember right. it as the novel with the great beginning. So, so it's kind of like, you know, when you're learning to fly a plane, it's great if you have a beautiful takeoff, but if you screw up the landing, no one's going to remember that. Including you. Um, <laughs> very much like that writing a novel. So I have lots of anxiety around it. Um, and, you know, I, I usually do get the ending wrong on the first draft. I don't know that I've ever really gotten it right on the first go. Um, so it's really, it is fraught. And it's the sort of thing that you just, you keep writing and writing and writing until you find it. Well, the way I write is I actually don't write draft after draft after draft. I write forward, back, forward, back. I think partly because I'm so obsessive about getting sentences right and things that I can't, I'll remember a sentence two pages ago that just wasn't right. So every time I sit down to write, I may intend to write 10 more pages, but I may end up spending three hours working on the last 10 pages that I wrote. I don't make myself go forward if I'm not going to get there. So what happens is it really takes me a long time to reach the end. And during that time, I may have had different ideas about the ending I'm going to arrive at. Um, but by the time I get to that last chapter, literally, I've been working on the book for probably at least a year, if not more. And so I'm almost more qualified to find the right ending. That doesn't mean it won't change. Uh, but, um, but, but, I, but I'm not doing first draft, second draft, third draft, and so forth. And that, that leads exactly to the question I wanted to ask, which is you're both mid-career novelists with five, five or six novels each. When you th think back to when you started writing and the things you thought you would be exploring or, or that made you curious or that drove you to the page to the first in the first place. Do you see changes from the writer you are now? Well, you know, you talked about 
being certain that you would not return to, to your town, mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania. Um, and I was certain that I would never return to the characters in my first book. Well, in fact, some of them have recurred in two further books. So I, you know, I never say never about anything. I think that one thing I've learned to do through my books is I've learned to be more forgiving of myself for one thing. Mm. Um, not to be so scared that I can't do it because I've done it before, right? So if I get stuck, I'm, I don't get as panicky. Um, I also, I did not go to an MFA program or have any creative writing training. I actually majored in art in college and I took only two English classes. I didn't really like them. Um, I mean, I was always good at writing, but I really started writing fiction seriously in my early 30s. And so all I had to go on were essays I read about writing, you know, I, was, I read, bought writing guides, and I find that I absorbed so many dogmatic pieces of advice from writers, whether they were Stephen King or Annie Lamott, that they didn't fit me and I felt guilty or I felt like I'm not a real writer because I don't write every day or I'm not a real writer um, because I don't do this or that. And I've learned that every writer makes his or her own rules. It doesn't mean you can't read what other people have to say. So I feel much more confident um, and, and maybe able to take more chances, but I also find that certain themes come back again and again for me, and I'm not one of those writers who is going to write a completely different novel every time I sit down. I think there are people like that. I think Jennifer Egan is one who, yeah. who really has a, but you know, I'm, if you know the world of painting and I return to that, I'm more like the painter Morandi, who I really revered, as a, who did these amazing still lifes, and variations on a theme, and I think that's who I am as a writer. So if I return, if characters come back to me, if I write again about New York in the plague years, which is something I seem to return to again and again, then that's who I am, and, and I occupy that territory more and more confidently, I think, with, and, and, and not feeling like I need to make excuses that I write about those same well, things again and again. Well, you still have questions about it that you want to explore. I do, yeah. I do. Jennifer? You know, when I was writing my first novel, I had no idea what I was doing. It, it's, writing a first novel is kind of like running a first marathon. You're not trying to win. You just don't want to die while you're doing it. You know? <laughs> so, so my goal was just to live through the writing of that first novel and to write a book that I'd want to read. Um, you know, I, I don't have particularly exotic tastes as a reader. And I figure if, if it's a book I want to read, then somebody somewhere else is going to want to read it also. So that's all I was trying to do, is live through the writing process and write a book that I would want to read. Um, as I've gotten further along, um, I, you know, I, am, I am drawn to some, some different subjects, I guess, but it, that's still really the guiding principle to me, to write a book that I would want to read. Um, when I wrote my first novel, I thought, okay, it's going to be easier now. You know, now I know how to write a novel. It'll never be this hard again. I was entirely wrong about that. What I learned was, yes, I know how to write a novel, but I only know how to write that novel. And, and the lessons I learned were not particularly portable. I could not apply them to my second or my third or my fourth. So in a certain way, it's, it's starting at zero every time for me. You know, I, I always feel like I, I am an imposter, I am completely unqualified to do this. Well, I think we all, you know, what we do is so weird. You know, we just sit there and make stuff up. Like, why are we doing this thing? So I certainly have those moments of like, what in the world am I doing here? But don't you feel having completed some, don't you when, you, when you get, like, as I say, in the middle of the ocean where you can't see the horizons on either side and you don't know if you have enough water to make it across, don't you tell yourself, I've done this before and I know I'll do it again, or is it really, are you really, does it really feel like starting from zero again each time? In Certainly seconds. the first year. The first year absolutely does. Yeah. Okay, and there we have to leave it because time has gotten away. Okay. I, Julia Glass, her most recent book is A House Among the Trees, and Jennifer Haig, Heat and Light, just came out in paperback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.